Okay, I got it going. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in. And uh, yeah, it's, I think you may have seen this on Reddit, but I just, uh, my name, okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Rajiv. I am from Toronto. Uh, I'm a data engineer by profession. Uh, I also organize the functional TO meetup group over here in Toronto. It's been going for two and a half, two years. It was my way of trying to learn pure script and uh, didn't work out very well. So right now, I'm actually taking a break from work and I'm actually learning Julia and pure script full time right now. Uh, my primary interests are logic programming, uh, dialog uh, and, and such. And I'm also interested in learning functional programming. So, I mean, why, why pure script? And uh, I think this is not, uh, like, I know the focus of pure script is more on the front end, but I'm just excited about the fact that probably I could use tree pure script and uh, come target JavaScript or C or C++ or Erlang. Uh, yeah, I know these are production ready, but the idea is amazing. Also the fact that I can target uh, databases and uh, servers and mobiles, uh, all these things together, it's just an exciting idea for me personally. And uh, I was talking to Alex about this talk by, I believe his name is Ryan Trinkle, who wrote, gave this talk called Full Stack Haskell. And he talked about the idea of, it's just great if one developer works on a ticket and that ticket touches the UI, the logic and everything. And you don't have to have these meetings where you talk to a JavaScript guy, a front end guy, and you, you just sign on the interface. So these things are personally great motivations for me to learn pure script. Now, uh, I'm more interested on the back end, and uh, so for the longest time I was trying to build this thing. Uh, what I wanted to do was try out to, to flesh out pure script in the back end, and what I just wanted to start out with was, how can I build a simple hello world in pure script? But the conditions I had was because I wanted to do this from my own like business ideas, so I want to do this in AWS Lambda and API Gateway. Uh, this together, is why I would say there was the first definition of what you call serverless right now. Uh, and the other ones I'll talk later, but I wanted to do this in AWS Lambda and API Gateway. And um, I just chose the Express Framework because there was a pure script plugin for Express Framework. So for those who do not know uh, much about serverless, API Gateway, I think it's more for reverse proxy, Perhaps a load balancer, you just specify your routes and your connections to your future service, the, the first services down the line. Uh, and you, it's, these are all like configurations. Uh, AWS Lambda, if you have already seen, is basically you write your code, your application, and you don't, don't worry about managing your servers. You, uh, AWS Lambda takes a code, uh, they call it a Lambda instance and it will load it into one of its servers for you and it'll manage scalability. I've seen uh, a talk where people are using production and they not only said that it's scalable, but also it reduced their costs by about 90%. And we, we and, and my job as the engineer, we have used uh, AWS Lambda for uh, ETL and we can I can say that we've reduced our cost by about 50%. So, in that way, it's cheap, but it's cheap only, only if you look at AWS Lambda. I've seen an article where if you take API Gateway in concentration with AWS Lambda, API Gateway is a bit expensive. So uh, the article in particular, they were initially on API Gateway and AWS Lambda, and then they, because it was getting very expensive, then they moved away to Elixir. But for somebody who wants to start out with a small business idea, AWS Lambda is a great choice. In fact, more so when they actually give you, I forget the number right now, but they give you about 75,000 or 100,000 executions free per month. So for longest, for a lot, if you have a small um, application, you may not even be charged for it. And this is the second last point is integrations, which it depends on where, how you, where you come from. Some people, cry out saying this is vendor lock-in, so it's not that great, and that's true in its own way. But some people say it's a feature that I can, for example, uh, whenever a file is created in S3, I can trigger uh, invocation to AWS Lambda to process it. Or uh, if some if there's a new row in my DynamoDB database, uh, I will, you know, it, it can again invoke a Lambda, which is pretty cool. Uh, I, I like the idea. 
And uh, we, we have used it in my ETL at my previous work. There are limitations of AWS Lambda though. Uh, it, the maximum five minutes execution after that, it interrupts your Lambda. And the maximum RAM right now is 3 GB. Now, what that means is conceptually, AWS Lambda is supposed to be stateless. You keep your state in the database. But practically, what happens is that it is impractical for the Lambda service to evict your Lambda instance the moment it's done with you, done with the execution. So it will keep the instance on their servers for some time. And it, how much time, we really don't know. But what happens is in that case, you can have global variables. And in fact, they do recommend that if you have a database connection, you put them as a global variable because it'll reuse a connection uh, for the longest time. So it's supposed to be stateless, but maybe not for a few minutes, and then you have no idea when they when they kick out your Lambda instance. So, uh, yeah. I, I, and, uh, do you mind if I uh, because I, like I think the serverless is super interesting, and I, like I, I have I have some experience deploying. Like you're interested in it for uh, you know some reasons here, like. Uh, it's cheap and whatnot, um, but I have some experience because I'm I'm really excited about it because it uh, it is cheaper for your own infrastructure. You don't have to worry about the servers underneath of it because I have been interested in Kubernetes for a while because it uh, makes deployment easier. I mean, as long as you can put anything in the container. And then, like it's a it's it's a uni unified interface for deploying like an updated version of this right. thing, and uh, like uptime and whatnot. And uh, it, it's 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 it, like I like complex systems, and Kubernetes is a nice complex system, and it has it offers like a lot of uh, promises. And so yeah, so like I've I've like tried um, some putting up an app on Kubernetes, and uh, it can get expensive because um, like if you want to put up a Kubernetes thing, you need one one uh, VM for the manager of the cluster, and then uh, what? Uh, there are, you have to have at least two VMs, I think, if you want, you know, guaranteed uptime or what, like what, whatever the benefits that Kubernetes offers of guaranteed uptime. Yeah, so that that that, that that's already um, at least two VMs, and it, it um, if you want to run like a Java container, which requires like two gigabytes of RAM, maybe a gigabyte or two, then you can't go for the cheapest VM on whatever your your cloud host is. You have to go up a few tiers to get enough RAM to run uh, like each container that you want to run. So then, like, yeah, and then you, each of these VMs you have to keep up all month long while you're running these apps, and that can get, you know, if you're if you're running, you know, a moderately sized VM and you're having it up all all month long, that can get like a couple hundred dollars a month, <laughs> even if even if nobody's using the apps that you put up there. It's kind of ridiculous. But the benefit is it's like, you, it's got a nice way of doing deployments. You don't have to like, I mean, the VMs, you can kill them and make a new one and just redeploy stuff on, I don't know. I, it, just, it's, it seems kind of nice. But these Lambda things, like you don't have to worry about the VMs at all. And uh, like just the host itself is um, responsible for efficient packing of everybody's processes together. But yeah, anyways, like I just want to share my experience of why I think Lambdas are Pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, to be honest, even if they, uh, before, let's say AWS Lambda came out and they didn't tell us the price of the execution, and they said, we'll, we'll take a code for you and make a scalable and fault tolerant, I think I would pay much more than what AWS Lambda was charging me. But the fact is that they have shown the price and it's super cheap. I mean, it's cheap and fault tolerant and scalable, and you don't have to manage servers. So I'm all for it. I was just talking. I mean, the article in 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 which, which which moved from Lambda to Elixir was. I think they were hitting real. I mean, their app really became successful, and they were no longer. Uh, I think they had many thousands of requests per minute, and at that point, API API became expensive. But I agree with you completely. I, I would pay a bit more for what it was. It was Lambda is offering me anytime. Um, yeah, then the other reason that I was super interested in Kubernetes um, was because it offered a stable API to program against. Um, 
it's like standards, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of like people who like went, who did a lot of thinking about what kind of design the system should have and like what kind of architecture it should have. So you can be relatively confident, it's gonna be relatively stable. Um, but like the one problem I have right now with uh, these Lambda, these functions as a service, is each host kind of has their own design yeah. and each host has their own limitations. Um, and so if, if you wanna like program a, like your app in a way that it works, you're not tied into any one of these systems, then you have to do the lowest common denominator, mm. perhaps. Nice. Um, so like that, 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 that's one of my original concerns with uh, uh, these functions as, as a service. Yeah. But uh, okay. yeah, anyways, I'll let you continue. No, for sure, I mean, uh, I would mention something later on, maybe more relevant to the topic, but yeah. So just want to show you for those who are trying to visualize what, uh, I don't know, since there's only four of us, I think, uh, has, has Gary and Justin, have you worked with AWS Lambda before? Just to get a sense of, before I keep on rambling. No, I've not. Um, this is all new to me, so I'm pretty interested. All right, sounds good. So I'm happy then, because my slides are, are useful. So AWS Lambda, in the simplest case would be, you have a file, you say, you have a my handler, and you give a function with three events in JavaScript, two in Python, uh, you would say event, and this could be any event. It's, it could be, like, for example, an S3 event when you create a file in S3 and you're saying, when on creation of a file in S3, call this, this handler, right? So this event will have the S3 bucket, the, the key name, and then this handler could go and pick up the file and process it. Uh, the same interfaces for, for the HTTP events. So I haven't coded at this level, but this event could be a request coming in from the API gateway. Uh, context is, I think, is just uh, a design future uh, future proofing uh, in case you have to add more things. So they, in case you add more information to be given to the handler, you just dump it in the context uh, variable. Uh, some of the examples there are some Android or mobile numbers, something of that sort. But it's just future proofing their design. Callback, as you can see in JavaScript, uh, I don't have used much, but you can use callback in a conventional way in JavaScript. So all AWS Lambda asks you is you, you, you have this file, you have this code, and you have your libraries. You zip that into, uh, you put in a zip, and you upload that zip to Lambda, and it'll take care of the rest. So this is AWS Lambda in the simplest form. So AWS Lambda is not the only functional service out there. You have Azure Functions and uh, Google Functions also. I have seen, I mean, the articles I've seen out there generally say, um, I mean, I, I know one article which compared, I believe, AWS Lambda with Azure Functions, and it found that AWS Lambda is much faster in terms of cold start and other parameters. But again, these are performance tests uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt, but the perception out there is that AWS Lambda is faster, especially for cold start problems, right? Because the biggest issue with uh, function as a service is cold start. Uh, when it's called for the first time, the, it has to be loaded into uh, into memory, and that initial load takes time. Uh, we coming back to talking about what Alice was talking about Kubernetes. Uh, you have projects like Fission uh, out there, which which let you do the same concept having functions, but your underlying layer, underlying infrastructure is now Kubernetes. I haven't worked with that, but that seems interesting as well. So. And to bring it out, like there's so many frameworks out there which have, uh, and I haven't used, I only used one, I've only used the last one, Zappa, and I've thoroughly enjoyed using Zappa, because, uh, but I haven't used much of the JavaScript ones, but the top three ones that I know of are the first one is serverless. It's confusingly called serverless, but that's the serverless framework. Uh, it, you can, it's multi-language framework as well. There's Apex, which I think uses Go internally, but again, supports multiple runtimes out there. And uh, Claudia.js is for JavaScript. Uh, there are many, many more out there, many more. Uh, if you want to refer to them, I've put the link below for the awesome serverless uh, multi-link page. I have a question. Why would one need a framework for using functions as a service? Because it sounds simple enough. You just write a function and you just copy this text file um, up to their, your host person, and they'll run it for you. They'll make sure it responds to the events that you need. Right. So, HTTP requests. So when I first 
I started first playing with Lambda before, you, I mean, I would say, I think before these frameworks came into picture and I had to manually write scripts to zip my, so I, I worked in Python. Uh, so I had to write scripts to zip my entire environment into a zip file in a particular way and then use the AWS Lambda API to upload that zip. Uh, these frameworks to, I mean, at, at one level, try to make it simple for you by giving, by, by if you stick to their configuration, they do stuff which makes it much more simpler. And I'll show, I'll show you an example of how it, it happens. But these frameworks basically, they, as we said, they, have, they try to build standards in a way. Standards is the wrong term, but they uh, scaffolding, for, if, if I can say, to make it more easier for you to quickly create an, uh, uh, a Lambda applic uh, FARS application and deploy it. Uh, I don't know if I example. Yeah, there's an example over here. Um, if I'm using serverless, for example, uh, you can say serverless create this template using Hello World, and then all these things are kind of done for you. So you can do it. You can then do serverless deploy. And automatically, it'll create your HTTP endpoints for you, and it'll create it'll it'll deploy a Lambda for you. So before these things came, I was doing it by hand. So I would think that the frameworks offer, like at level one, frameworks offer these commands over here, for example, uh, service deploy, but also if you have the third last line, that's the second last line, if you only want to deploy a function, you change your code, but you do not change your endpoints, you, again, makes it easy for you to, uh, to deploy a function only. I, I remember when I had to deploy my function. So my function, for example, when I was working on it two years ago, uh, was a Lambda which listened to an S3. And when I used to deploy my function, it would wipe away the integration to the S3. And I had to manually, again, uh, recreate uh, the integration from S3 to my Lambda. And these are my custom scripts. And I'm sure others would custom scripts as well. And I think frameworks like serverless just made it, uh, just standardized it uh, much better than we did. Okay, so it sounds like a lot what uh, pulp is to the peer script. Right, uh, right. People. Uh, cool. And uh, I think they're taking, I mean, a lot of these frameworks, not just serverless, and I think the one you, you showed, sent me, Alex, uh, now 2.0, uh, they're trying to take it to the next level. They're trying to uh, keep, abstract away the cloud, uh, these fast services from your application, and I think it's an exciting place to go. Cool. Uh, so serverless framework, just, it, as I said, they're trying to they, they target all these different clouds. Uh, there are all these different services, and I don't know other frameworks, but what Serverless has in particular is the fact that they, ha they have a plugin-based architecture. So one of the plugins which I'm using right now is a plugin called Serverless Offline, which I'll show it to you right now. And this is for me to test my code locally before I push it to uh, AWS Lambda, and it, it worked as like a charm. So I can't go further without saying, like this is mostly the great work done by Nicholas, Nikolai Obedin, who wrote the Pure Script Express library uh, on the left, and Louis Pilfold, who wrote the Pure Script AWS Lambda Express. So he wrote the, it's, it's called AWS Lambda Express, but right? it's actually Serverless Express because he wrote a plugin for serverless as well. Um, my contribution was just, I took the Pure Script AWS Lambda Express and I, I just ported it to, your script point uh, one two, uh, just change all the f's to effects and all. But uh, these guys did most of the heavy work. Okay, so I'm going to show you a demo of. But before I'm just going to show the code. Can you see? Okay, can you see my screen? Can you yeah. see? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, so. I I'm going to start off with so when you when when you do serverless create new project uh, I think the the most significant change you would see from others it, it creates a serverless YAML file for you and uh, when you do serverless deploy I think this is the file that I refers to 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 deploy your functions to you for you so you provide basic stuff over here can you see the font I mean, is it clear enough for you yeah, yeah it looks good. Yeah, so yeah, you provide basic stuff over here like AWS, your runtime, your memory, how much you want it to be. And I think the interesting part is over here, and 
what do you saying over here is, hey, if I, if I get an event matching my base part over here on line 15, then what you do is you call a handler, uh, which is the JavaScript file at output main index handler. Uh, so on a side note, uh, the plugins, I mentioned the serverless offline here, and uh, I installed that beforehand, and I specified over here, and, the, and then I can use it. So, but coming back, if if you specify the path to output main index handler, uh, it just it just works, this flows very well. And what happens if you use Atom at least, and you compile your pure script code, it compiles as you know to the output folder. So this output main index handler is basically the main dot PURS in the source file. So I'm going over there. And I'm going to start with this over here. If you can see line uh, 22 to 24. So this is what Lewis worked on, is that you give it an app, which is an express app, and it converts the app for you into, one, into a Lambda interface, but two, I guess, no, I think, yeah, that's about it. It, it, it converts it into a Lambda interface that serverless can use. Uh, so that's what Lewis worked on. And this app over here, it's very simple. I'm just going to. Uh, so the most simplest thing you could do is you have this get on this route uh, on the base route and you do an index handler. And uh, before I go there, I just wanted to show you the signature for get. It's the for all our route path. Can you see that? Can you see line 18? It's gray on my screen. So, okay, it works. Okay. So, route yeah. in R, and R is string in this case, and string is an instance of, okay, just a big, just a big caveat. I just started working on PureScript a few weeks ago, so I'm not an expert, but I think R, uh, string is an instance derived of route pattern. Uh, so, you can use strings, or you can even use regex, and uh, you give it a, a handler function, a handler monad. And you get back an app, and and this goes on. So the index handler over here is something very simple as uh, send JSON status OK. And the 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 signature for send JSON is, uh, and all these functions they all give back a handler. So this is the most simplest hello world. This is what I got working two three weeks ago. So uh, this is the basic one, and I'm going to go forward and show you how I made this work. So the first step I did was, so yeah, so I'll build to get the latest JavaScript and this SLS offline start is actually the plugin. I'm not deploying this to AWS Lambda yet. This is still running locally on my machine. I'm just testing it locally. And the offline start is the plugin that I showed you. So, I build. Can you see my uh, second window on the right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So that's it. So I go to call. I just call local host three thousand. As you can see on the left, it's running and gives uh, you okay. So now if I Go back and I change this to OK, Rajiv. And I close this and I build it again. Okay, and if I run this again, it should change. So it works locally, that's great. Uh, it's not guaranteed that if it works locally, it works on uh, on look on the server though, because I think I the mistake I made when I first ran this, I did not update my package of JSON, uh, which I think so. I that's one more thing I think uh, servers will automatically look at package of JSON and probably will install it for you. I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure, but uh, yeah. So you have to. I mean, that's a mistake I made. I you have to update your package of JSON. Uh, I guess to make to to ensure that if it works locally, it works on the server. Uh, the next step I do is I do SLS. That's a short form for serverless uh, deploy, I believe. And uh, let the gods of demo help me. So then this will 
look at that YAML file that you, that you defined, and then it'll use that to know where to deploy this to. Mm -hmm. So th that's the thing about uh, main lights. So, the, so it does not. It'll, it'll generate a URL for you, and you can see it's a it's a it's like a alphanumeric string. And I think you have, to, but it's a string that it's made once for you. While it's a, 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 let me let me show you an example. It may be easy for you to see that way. Uh, works slightly differently for serverless, but it gives you and it deploys for the first time. It gives you a URL, and I guess you haven't done this, uh, but you connect that URL to your your domain name, and you know you you build that DNS path, and that URL will always be alive as long as your your gateway is alive. Uh, let me let me let me show you what the output is, and maybe it gets more clear. But uh, any questions? So yeah, so any questions up to this point? There's a little bit of a discussion going on in the chat at the moment, which is um, saying about you might and actually not even need to rerun pulp build if you're using the uh, PERS IDE sort of plugin server because it recompiles as you change things anyway. But um, yeah, if you if you can find the chat window, Justin has something to say about that. That might be interesting. Uh, the chat window in Zoom or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, to be honest, um, I, I'm aware of PERS, but right now I just want to get, you're right, I, I can definitely look. I, I know there's this incremental build thing. Uh, right, yeah. I was just like, I just want to get things working. and. Um, <laughs> that makes sense. And, and that was, I was so happy when I got working. But you're right. I I will look at that, and and this is the way I, I, I the way I like to work. I just want to get things working and get to a level where I get bored. And I get bored, I start improving myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the thing that would give you is you could basically have a much quicker sort. Of, sorry, the thing that would give you is you would get in a much better sort of like feedback cycle for when you were working on it, yeah. because uh, depending on whether the offline thing can update you know, in line, in, in line as well. It means you would basically avoid the need to wait for each compilation step. So when, you know, once you save your file, you could test it again almost immediately, but yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, how do I see a chat? Um, I, I can't see the, oh, it's on the dot. Do, uh, the chat. do you know how that offline thing works? Because it's interesting because you, you, you say um, start offline, right? But then it says offline listening, and then it says the first request might take a few extra seconds. Do you know why it says that? Uh, over here? I mean, to be honest, so this is the offline. I mean, this is the first part where offline. And where you see it takes a few seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, to be honest, I think it's plugging. I, I'm saying I, I just uh, Googled it. I found a plugin and it's installed it. So I really didn't. Really OK. Um, did you it's have to just install some uh, Docker thing beforehand? Like, I wonder if it maybe it makes some new Docker a container for it. Well, I don't know. I, I don't. I mean, I don't believe it uses Docker. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I, I'm feeling that it's plugging into the service framework, and it's the service framework which is actually saying this, uh, not necessarily the plugin. This is my first. But again, I haven't. Oh, plugged. okay. Like, so, so like the, the serverless framework might not know that, that it's running locally. Uh, yeah, having said that, I haven't seen that. We can, we can, we can try again, but I haven't, we can find out. I uh, haven't really noticed if that message comes in. And I, the thing is, I, so serverless, I didn't spend too much. I think I spent a bit of time, it wasn't working for me, but serverless has an invoke local feature. So I'm guessing serverless has a local testing uh, option as well. But uh, it's been a while. I think I may have tried it. It didn't work. And I moved on to this. I could be wrong. But uh, so maybe both of them, maybe this message is for that invoke local thing. And uh, this this plugin piggy banks on the framework and it reuses that. I don't know. But uh, it's done. So let me show you. You can see the bottom of the screen. This is where. This is the endpoint on API Gateway. This is where it's deployed to. So it has this weird name. I don't know if you can control what this name should be. But then you get then this this name, this URL that you probably so I'm not very clear about how the DNS would work in this case, but you I guess you have a DNS server or you would tell AWS to have your your company.com name and you 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 link it to this link. 
uh, this URL over here, and that's how you link, you know, that's how you would do it. Um, so let me now take this and do curl, I think that should be it. And there you see, uh, it's online, this is, this is a remote call. I, do you see, so I know the cameras and the, the yeah. So, so if you, if you didn't use the serverless uh, framework, that's this serverless thing, did um, with this peer script function that you wrote, mm -hmm. um, you would have like how would you deploy this? Like how would you test your this peer script function locally if you did not use this serverless framework? Um, I don't know to be honest because I mean you could. Because like that was always the conceptual problem I already had. That always the barrier that to entry for the serverless stuff. Like, okay, so I can write code, yeah. but how do I test it locally? Um, hmm. So let's, yeah, let's, I would assume you would just set up like um, you know like a unit test situation. So you wouldn't be testing the handlers, mm -hmm. but you could test code that the handlers were using to do that kind of thing. So you might implement most of your mm -hmm. stuff under just a normal JavaScript function. And then, you know, if you've got a normal test setup, you can just pulp test it or whatever. That's Oh, that's a good idea. It would be something along those lines. Because the serverless part of it is kind of like the infrastructure to make it work. It's not mm -hmm. actually super important to, you know, you don't really need to test that because that's not really what, you know, not, not the interesting part of what you're testing, I guess. So, that's the way yeah, that's true. It. So I'm looking at the, uh, the output index. I wonder uh, if there's something over here. No, all, all this does is just it creates uh, a handler, I guess. So, mm, so maybe a, a bit of a hint over there. No, no, so yeah, I, would, I guess Gary's answer is better than what I was going to show. But yeah, so that's it. Any, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to now uh, remove this. Unless you want me to keep it up for any other questions, but uh, I'm going to remove it. Cool. So I will delete that. So that was the basic, so basic uh, thing I worked on. Um, but I do want to show you uh, more stuff. But, but this is not on, not on serverless. This is just Pure Express. By and my task eventually uh, next few weeks is to get to see if I can make this work on on serverless. So what I wanted to show you was the can I, the typical. Uh, to do app, so let me let me get over there first. So, so but it's all local. It's not on serverless, but I just wanted to show you what Pure Express could do. So let's start with. I'm gonna look at chat before I forget. So I'll, before I forget, I'll, if, we, if we close the uh, if we close the window, will I lose all the chat? Or uh, can I? Or can should I copy, should I look at copy paste right now? Uh, uh, I think it stays persistent. I think it's persistent. So yeah, it should remember if you close it. So I have, I'll, uh, I'll have a look at it after I finish what you mentioned about the POS ID. Uh, all right. I can keep my chat over here. All right. Uh, okay. That's the answers. Okay. So I just want to show you. Uh, yeah. So, so I don't know. Is Ali the camera? Like, do I need to do this for you just to see the end, or can you see the sides too? Can I can. You see, can you see yeah, the end on the screen, or can you? Yeah, I can. You can. Okay. So, local host eighty eighty. Just to show, so this is running locally on my machine, uh, and this is a simple to example. And uh, if I do a list, there's nothing there. But now, if I want to create something, I'm just giving a, a feel of the to the app before we dive into the code. And uh, so I want to do create um, description uh, div doc. Okay, and this is also notes on the left of the logger as logging. What I'm saying, and okay, it creates one. And now I want to list 
uh, let's say, okay, yeah, I can see below, okay, it's done false, and then I can do stuff like uh, done, and I can do zero, and so it's done, if I list it, it's done, it's true. So basic to that, so now I just wanna show you the code for it now. And this is not my code, this is, this, this is part of the examples that shipped with uh, Pure Strip Express. Uh, I'm just, I just made it work on my machine and that's it. So, so I'm on main, you have an init state. And if I go to init state over here, uh, it's actually a uh, effect of app state and app state over here is a ref. Uh, where an RF of a uh, to do. And uh, yeah, so initially it's creating uh, empty, empty uh, array. And then coming back. So as, you, so as it's obvious, since it's a ref, this, this application by itself, I, I can't just literally take this and put it on Lambda because it will fail because there's no state. I mean, it, there's a state on the, on the machine, right? So I, I mean, what the example would be instead of ref, you, you call a database. So let's, so over here is the main uh, interesting part where you're setting up the app and that happens over here. Uh, app setup. And uh, so, and this basically, it's so you lift effect. Uh, maybe I should ask the PS guys over here. Uh, I think this, there's lift effect inside an app is a monad, so there's lift effect. So does this make this a uh, monad transformer? I'm not sure. I don't know if that's the case, but uh, yeah, that's right. Um, that that's essentially yeah, what's going on here. I assume app is probably aff or some other kind of uh, monad which supports effects, but it doesn't. It's not effect itself. So yeah, by using lift effect, you're essentially saying like, uh, you know lift this trans this through the stack of transformers to to run it at the appropriate place so yeah all right. Cool. All right. Good to know. uh yeah so that's the first one and then you have these different so i, I have uh, the the signatures here uh set props over here you're getting basically you're seeing properties on um, the express uh middleware uh is it middle uh, i'm not sure okay so i should take that back but yes, and then you have, okay, I think use is where you talk about middleware. So you use, again, using a logger. So let me see my, wait, this works, if I can go in. Okay, perfect. So I'll just say over here, use a use specified middleware handler. Uh, I'm using a logger in this case. And uh, yeah, so there's maybe some way you can help me with understanding. So uh, if I go to the logger, Method. So let's start with logger. Uh, again, you do a lift effect, you get the state, and then you have this function called get original URL. Again, this is in the request uh, request file, and uh, it's, it, again, all these are handlers. And uh, this is what you saw uh, over there. This is what was being logged on the console, like the, the, the string over there. And this is where I wasn't sure. So it says set user data logged URL and log is the key. And uh, so this is this is what I, I this is what happens here. And if I go back to app state, we have the get logger and the get logger status. And if I go to get logger status, uh, miss it. Yeah, it is. Uh, it says get use data logged, and uh, I'm guessing this is like a middleware thing. Or where if I pass data from logger state over here, I should see it over here, but I don't see it, so I'm not sure. It's, I, I'm misunderstanding. I, I show I'm I show what I'm talking about, and uh, yeah, so you get this logger status, and if in case it's not that you're missing, so what I don't understand so far. It seems like that uh, logger thing is kind of like a the state monad. Uh, um, okay. So that uh, at one point, yeah. So it's like it's like this global context. Um, so like well, yeah, well, it's 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 a way of communicating between uh, 
different handlers in the request handling chain. That's like uh, uh, one of the abstractions that Express has chosen. You can have multiple functions um, receive an HTTP request right. and then uh, do stuff. And one, one, one of the things that uh, you can do with an HTTP request is put additional properties in that map of, in that object of HTTP request data. So it's effectively treating that HTTP request as a mutable, mutable thing. So if you want to communicate from one um, HTTP handler to a different one that handles that same HTTP request, you can just put data on that, on that uh, request and then retrieve that data um, in, a, in a different handler. It's kind of, a, I don't, I'm not a big fan of it, but that's something you can do in Express. Right. Uh, so I was like, if I go back and if I'm over here, I'm just gonna clear my screen. Okay. And uh, what, I wanted, what I was trying to do was I was trying to do local post to eighty, and I was doing logger. And this gives back logger. Uh, I guess so what is over here? Account. Uh, I, I think I see what's happening there. <laughs> it will probably always give you that because it's using the log and middleware before it actually deals with the root. Uh, so, so this get request is essentially, before it gets to the get, it always replaces that state with the URI that you just looked at. So, <laughs> so when you actually run the logger endpoint, it's probably always going to return logger because uh, yeah, yeah. the middleware happens first. Right, right. So yeah, that makes sense. So, so I was wondering why that was happening. Cool. I guess one thing that you could try there is change the um, change it to uh, like use an array there instead. So it could keep or a, a list. So that instead of just setting the data every time, you could extend it with the the route that was run last. And then if you printed it, uh, you know, use the logger endpoint, you could make it print everything that has been run recently. But I mean, if you run that in a real app, obviously it'd be a giant memory leak, but it, for the purposes of this, it might um, help with seeing what's going on. Uh, I, I won't display my lack of PR skills on, online, but <laughs> <definitely try it>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'll definitely try it out. Uh, but thanks for the time. Uh, cool. So yeah, that was the log. But thanks for guy for, for for finding out why it was not working. But um, yeah, but let's just show you the other ones. Uh, Let's let's look at something interesting like create to the handler. Um, yeah, so you go to app state. Yeah, uh, you as I as you saw me, you create one, you get the query param in, and uh, yeah, if it doesn't work, you throw an error, or else you modify the ref and add the, the new state. So from a from a I haven't so I, I'm really keen on building these apps, and I just have to say. From a pure script newbie, uh, even though I don't understand a lot of the F uh, functional line concepts, I personally can, I feel like I can write something uh, just on what I see over here. I, I don't need to be too deep into the um, FP concepts, but what I see over here, I understand, and I can make something work. So that's what I like. So I think that Nikolai's done a good job with pure script express, and I'll be reading his code to learn more. Uh, anything else I can show you? But it's probably so. Other handlers are very similar in and with a similar pattern. Uh, and yeah, that's. Probably. So, is this something that you can put onto the uh, serverless? I don't know yet. I mean, I, I feel like you can. If Obviously, you can't use the ref. You would probably have to use some kind of uh, uh, data store like S3 or a Postgres database. So, I feel you can. But the changes I have to make is let's say I, take, I have to first convert. I don't know how to do it yet, but uh, I guess after make this into more uh, calling a database instead of just reading in memory. And yeah. Well, like well, one of the things that seems, um, well, because the, the first example you showed us where it just returns like a hello world yeah. on serverless, that is just a function that calls a callback when it's done executing, right? Um, and then so when that callback is executed, then the serverless, the thing running the serverless can just kill that function. Okay. But um, with this app that you've written here, this to-do uh, app. 
I mean, this, this is an example from right. The, yeah, for this example one, um, this this doesn't call a callback when the when this program as a whole is done. It just it runs on a on a loop, and oh. it, it just runs forever. Right. This is just a web server. It just runs forever. The first one didn't either, though, because it was using the library which adapts Express apps to work uh, for serverless. So this one would probably need a, a, a couple of changes to create handlers that would work for for the Lambda, I guess. But um, Rajiv, oh, could see. you go back to your other app a second and show uh, Alex like how you were actually using the, um, the the library to kind of convert your Express app into a, a thing that might help? You want to look at the JavaScript code? Or do you want to look at the JavaScript code? Uh, yeah, the JavaScript. Uh, so. So it's this make handler function, and if I can get right. into it, and that's how it happens over here. Yeah, so if you, if you go back to your main again a sec. Um, so you see how, Alex, this app is, as far as I can tell, is a, an express app. So instead of launching it directly, like you would normally do in the other case, this handler is then kind of defining the entry point for it. So I guess this is where uh, the kind of yeah. it figures out how to do the, you know, does whatever magic it needs to do to turn it into um, a Lambda rather than, yeah, running it as a Cloud okay. server. Yeah, I, I, I can see how that would work. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Can, can I take a look at that make handler code again? Because I, I imagine this make handler would have to um, conform to the interface of the um, AWS function, like because that that receives a certain input and then it has to take the URL from that and then pass it into the Express application and then when it gets the response back, it has oh I guess it has to spin up that Express application. Well, it doesn't make a new process; it just runs the pure script function that implements that process. Um, but yeah, I can understand how that would work. Cool. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So then, yeah. So yeah. So now I can see why you're optimistic about being able to take that to do application and then just wrap it in wrap it using this make handler function and then deploy this to um, uh, using serverless, right? Yeah, right now, it's just blind fate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was like, if I fail, I'll fail. But right now, I'm just taking one step at a time and making mm -hmm. things. And yeah, probably it, I think it should, but I, I, I figure out if it fails, if it fails. Uh, mm -hmm. For me to experiment with. Yeah. yeah, definitely definitely seems promising. Um, it looks, it's pretty cool, this. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was the to do. And uh, I just want just to show you uh, the other interesting examples as well. I think. Somebody more advanced would want to see um, one of the JS middleware. So, um, if you see this example, I think I'm not 100% sure how this works, but I think body parser is a middleware and uh, for Express, and you want to use it in your app. So, you define export wave like this. And then in your actual app, uh, you, use, you, you say use external. Uh, and use JSON on body parser. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I guess if you do send or send JSON somewhere, I'm guessing it'll pick up the middleware. But uh, I just wanted to show you that as well. And uh, this, I don't understand what this means. Maybe you all, you all will. That's embedding an app. So I embedding an uh, Express app in what? That's what I, I don't understand. Uh, but if you do, it's all video other examples. Yeah, I was just recalling uh, maybe a few months ago, um, Jay, Jay Kashmar, he had uh, written an Alexa app. You know, you know Alexa, that's an Amazon thing. Yeah. And I think, he, I think the only way to make Alexa apps is AWS Lambdas. Does that sound right? Um, probably, I guess. Yeah, I think that. Cause I, I, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, because I, th I think maybe he had deployed an app to AWS Lambdas. And if so, he might have an application, like some PureScript library, which more or less directly 
corresponds to this AWS Lambda you know, interface. Um, okay. But then in that case, you wouldn't be using these express um, JS abstractions, like this middleware thing. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll do a search, see if I can find that. Yeah, I guess it depends on how your app works. Like if you just need a single function or something, then probably you wouldn't necessarily want to use the express stuff. But if you're developing a you know, more substantial app, then I guess this is really useful because it takes out a lot of the kind of you know, stuff you would otherwise have to deal with to, to um, yeah, you know, just deal with alternative routes and so on within the, within the thing, within the app. So this, this T fan, so you, are, are you saying that you have a existing JavaScript Express application which is big and you already embed a pure script app into that? Is that what you're saying? Is that Oh for this example you mean? Yeah. Um I guess so, yeah. I'm not I'm not too sure what it's doing either to be honest. <laughs> um yeah. yeah. All right. So hi. I'll get back to my question. I think that's kind of about it. And uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, Alex, you had this question about versioning, right? But so yeah, I don't. Uh, or I yeah, question. yeah, because you, remember when you deployed that application right. um, to AWS, it gave you this kind of six-digit hash. Um, you know, six-digit. Yeah, that one. And then it's like dot something dot something dot AWS. Um, so yeah, so like every, every, every time you update, like does it have a concept of updating an existing Lambda? Yeah, so if I, like that, that was what, if I did, uh, so if I go back, yeah, so if I do the second last line, deploy function, my function, I believe what it does is it just updates the function by keeping the URL the same and the endpoint, the API gateway the same. Oh, okay. That way you can make changes in your code uh, without redeploying the entire stack of services. Uh, and yeah, that's about, that's what I feel. And uh, yeah, the other one was how do you manage? Uh, the question you had was how do you manage um, different uh, lambda spans? I'm a, bit, I'm a bit new there as well. I've mostly worked on single lambdas talking to an S3 file or talking to an API gateway, so I really don't know much about that. But uh, looking at now 2.0 that you sent me, it seems pretty cool. I have, I think they have an opinionated way of doing it, and uh, I'll probably check that out just to see. But I personally haven't managed dependencies from, from lambda to lambda. Have you ever used the surge.sh service? Because I, th I, that was in that awesome serverless um, list that you sent, and I remember seeing. I see other people use that sometimes. I think it, yeah, it it uses this lambda thing. So you can take like anything on the CLI, any app, and it makes it. It just puts it public. I'm not sure how it works. So I have to take a look at that. I'll, I'll just check and see if you had that. Cool. Um, but yeah, I was going to ask it what like what the difference is between using just something. Mm, uh, using something really simple like that versus actually deploying to AWS Lambda proper like this. Um, but I Maybe I should have a look at that too, but I haven't checked it out. Okay. So this is in case for those who want to look at the types, these are the types on the, for the hand and the app. And uh, yeah, I, I think you all can read by that, maybe. But uh, this is about it. And then one more thing which I think I, I found through Justin's uh, resources in case for those who want to find out is this uh, a web it's a framework written purely in PureScript and they seem to be really uh, up to date and they like good, good documentation. So that could be one other thing I would check later on, but right now I just want to get something working uh, and in production. So I'll probably stick with this for now. And yeah. Uh, if you want to see the, the code that I showed you, the hello world, that's a link on the top. And all the examples I showed you are in the Pure Strip Express examples. And yeah, that's about it from my side. Uh, any questions? I guess we asked during the presentation. Yeah, I think so.
cool. I mean, yeah, thanks for doing that. That was really interesting. Yeah, thanks for organizing that. Yeah, all new to me. I've not. Um, I've kind of known what you know serverless and stuff is about vaguely, but I've never really looked into how any of it works. And it looks like this is a really nice way to kind of get things working pretty quickly. So yeah, thanks for. Uh, yeah, I, I I have one question. Um, do you do you need to do like a webpack bundle to put all this into one file before you send it up to uh, something like AWS Lambda? Uh, I think serverless. I don't know how it happens internally, but I think serverless takes care of it on its own. So it automatically. I think it looks at my package.json. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you you said that you had done this without serverless though, right? Where you had written something and just uploaded it. Not on JavaScript. I, I did it in Python. Okay. And did you have to do any bundling? Or no, you said that was just a zip? I, I had to zip all. So Python has a concept of environments, right? Uh, virtual environments. So I had to go and pick up all the libraries in the virtual environment, zip it, and put it in the root of the root of my zip along with my handler file. So I had to do all that. Yeah. But I, I don't know how it happens in JavaScript, to be honest. It's, it's probably pretty similar, I guess. Yeah. Um, as long as your NPM packages are in some, are, are there, you don't have to put them all into one file. Um, I, I'm guessing that Lambda would just uh, unzip your file into its Lambda system. So that, yeah, I guess that's kind of nice. That's one step you can avoid. That's, I guess that's, if, if you're used to doing pure script and then having a bundle to run in the browser, it sounds like that's something you can maybe avoid uh, if you, when you're deploying to Lambda. Yeah, uh, I think it's um, I, you know, I think it's serverless which takes care of all the heavy lifting. Uh, I, I remember things failed because I did not update my package.json. So uh, I'm guessing that what that means is that serverless will look at my package.json and install the libraries for me uh, and do a zip. So uh, which is pretty cool. So, if, yeah. if you have questions for me, I think I'm going to so I'll, I'll question for you, for you. Uh, if I can go back. And I do, I do have another question for you, but I could ask after you ask us. <laughs> question for me is, I think uh, Phil had a paper where he talked about, the, I, I couldn't find it, so maybe I should. He, for me, the idea is, can I write my web server abstractly uh, in such a way that if I had to change uh, frameworks, for example, not just Node.js Express, but if I want to move to uh, another PureScript web framework, or I want to move the same web, web application to Elixir, for example, is there a way for me to write my code in an abstract, using abstract types, which can be compiled or which can be transformed into a different uh, web framework? So I, I, see, I remember seeing a paper from Phil's talking about, but I, I don't think he necessarily asked this question, but that was an inspiration for me. Uh, but I'm wondering if you guys know of a way of doing that, or is the library out there doing that? There's not a, there's not a library that I know of that does it, but um, I can think about what I would do personally to set up something like that. Because you could, the thing is, it, it depends what capabilities you would want to model for uh, you know, for the framework you're going to, you know, the pseudo framework you're going to use, because I guess the problem is if you just encode everything Express does, it might be that that doesn't actually, you know, translate to another thing, even if you've abstracted it. So you probably have to be quite conservative in the capabilities that you would provide in this abstract thing. But um, I think that potentially all you would do is instead of having app as the thing that you build your requests and such, and you would just have a, like, you, just, you would create a monad which has all of the actions that app supports that you want to use. Mm -hmm. And then you would create an instance for it for, you know, um, Express or whatever it is else that you want to use. So um, by leaving that free until you actually, you know, run your main or, um, or sorry, leaving that as a constraint rather than a concrete app type, you would, you, you would then uh, just choose that when you run main or, you know, feed it into your express handle or, or however it is that you want to run that thing. But um, I'm not sure. There, there probably is some more thought that's been put into that, but that's just me thinking aloud off the top of my head if I was going to do something like that. So, yeah. uh, is it, can it be a monad or does it have to be a free monad? Uh, either way is an option. So if you write it as a free monad, 
you can write it as a concrete type. And then what happens is when you get to the point at which you want to make it like non-abstract, you essentially write an interpreter, which translates it from the free version into whatever the other thing is. Yeah. But you can also just do that by having a type class where you have all of the members defined abstractly that you would use on this thing. So um, one of them is like the, the like finally tagless style, as they call it, um, is when you have a class that kind of implements that stuff. Um, and it's, but either approach has pros and cons, and you could even use both. Like you could write one that actually just converts it into a, uh, you could write a type class, which is instantiated with a free monad, and then you run an interpreter with it. So all of these things are sort of complementary. They're just different approaches to uh, solving the same kind of issue. Yeah, I guess my question was, um, I mean, a, a monad would be a good interface. I mean, I could still do a lot with a simple monad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But uh, uh, Gary, when you were talking about um, programming abstractly against whatever capabilities are in the are in the runtime, um, were you kind of referring to like an extensible effect type of system? Um, where Not you necessarily. Just, uh, I was just thinking about the things like you know the um, the user state thing that we saw that was being used to kind of store that log, uh, or you know the kind of things that might not exist, for instance, in another framework, because it's something that some state support that Express has internally, there might not be an equivalent if you were using a different framework, that kind of thing. Not, not so much um, specific effects, but just a case of what operations can you provide on, um, on the thing that would, that would be interpretable under different frameworks. So, I mean, things like your actual request responses, you know, get, post, whatever, routes, all that would, you know, generally be the same for, for all of them. But choosing, but using middlewares and such like that, the middleware would probably only work with Express, say. So you might have to be more restricted in what you could choose there. So yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Uh, so yeah, that's all from the side, and yeah, I can relinquish control over the screen unless you want. You Thank you. Um. Yeah, bringing it back to like uh, some peer script project. Like, I think Try Peer Script is uh, a peer script app that's kind of maintained by the uh, some like community members here. Um, that I think would not be able to de be deployed to serverless. I think right now it's on a cheap VM that runs all the time. It's like five, maybe five dollars a month. Um, but the reason I say that probably couldn't be put on the serverless is because it keeps a lot of files around, I think, um, to be ready for compilation. Like, I forget how that works. But it keeps yeah. a lot of pre-compiled stuff back in, the, in the server side so that when the client sends requests to the server for compilation, these, it's already there, all the dependencies or something. Yeah, as far as I understand it, the basically all of the dependencies that it makes available, like there is a, a set of libraries it has access to, have already been compiled and it keeps those kind of com compilation products around. Um, but I guess the other problem is it runs the actual compiler in Haskell as well. So I don't think you can run that on Lambda. <laughs> oh, you don't think so? Rajiv, do you I, know? I could be wrong, but I don't know. It's possible. So I, you, can, you can use the process. Uh, you can use Node.js to call some some other. Oh, that's right. I remember listening to a, a podcast from the Google the Google Cloud, and uh, they said, "Well, right now we only support Node.js and Python for our Google Cloud functions, but interesting hack is that you can just um, have a .exe file, and then from your Node program, you just process .exec this." other file <laughs> so you could yeah. probably get like some like uh, compile your Haskell into a dot exe and then just execute that from your JavaScript <laughs> yeah I know I, I was feeling though I mean I tried this for Python 2 Python 3 uh, when there's no Python so it's I had a file calling on the file and it was slow it uh, so I'm not sure but it depends maybe it's okay uh, if it's just for try pure script, but I felt it was slow to do it, but who knows? I haven't tried out the process thing. But um, can we just, just to add to the Lambda discussion? So you get final MB harder space on the Lambda, on the Lambda server. So if the pre-compiled, uh, let's say technically, let's say you have pure script app and you have to pre-compile something and the pre-compilation is within final MB. 
then you could still store it locally on the Lambda server. The only problem is if that Lambda is kicked out for lack of use, you'll have to again call it back and again load it. So, but that happens. That happens if, if the that happens if uh, no one's calling the Lambda. But you can you do have 500 MB at least on AWS Lambda. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, about the try peer script thing. I don't know if it'd be worth it to move something like try peer script over to Lambda because it would be almost a complete rewrite, I imagine, of the try peer script project. Yeah. Um, just because of the way it's architected and such. Um, and also, right now it's only five dollars a month. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, these AWS functions are super cheap, but is it worth it to re-architect the try peer script project? just to save four dollars <laughs> maybe i mean it depends how depends how i don't know i don't know uh yeah i know it probably doesn't make sense no. but, yeah are there any other peer script projects that could that might make sense to be moved moved on to like in a functions a, a serverless thing i was wondering uh, the, the, the discourse would that work on what is what is this course based on is python is it uh, that is a Ruby. Ruby? I believe, yeah. Maybe it is Lambda, but I believe some serverless frameworks have Ruby support. So if, if it's expensive to host the disclosed servers. Right now, it's on a digital ocean droplet. And in that droplet, it has, an, it, it created its own instance of Postgres, I think. Oh, okay. Um, but I think in the configuration, you can say the database is somewhere else. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how important it is to have the serverless, you know, host be the same as your database host provider. Like, if if I use AWS for my uh, uh, functions host, do I also have to use AWS as my database host? Is that important? No. You, you, I probably you can make a you can call it on to a different database, right? I mean, it's just like. Yeah. yeah you, you should, I don't think it limits you to AWS databases. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 That was great. I think. Oh, there's one. One other idea I had was, um, because functions like AWS functions, it lets you take any single function and execute it as its own process, right? Um, and then you can call another AWS Lambda from a different AWS Lambda, right? So, yeah. I mean, this kind of corresponds to AF fibers, right? Because AF is its own like scheduler. Um, well, it does have a scheduler, but each, like, each fiber in an AF can spawn a child fiber. Um, and that's, yeah, so I, like I was wondering if it might make, like if it's a, like how similar the correspondence is between an AF and an AF fiber to the, uh, the, the idea of an AWS function and like other AWS functions. Um, like could you uh, implement the AF interface with a monad that uh, uh, is AWS functions? Um, I don't know how much sense that makes, but. Uh, yeah, I imagine you probably could. I suspect it would be pretty difficult though. <laughs> because I mean, AF itself is pretty complicated, even just dealing with, you know, one machine. So the, in principle, I guess that's the idea that these yeah. things are function like in the sense that you can just call them and, you know, like you say, run them like fibers. Cause uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know the details of how to do that and achieve something with the kind of uh, reliability that um, AF has is probably going to be, you know, a little tricky, but yeah, I mean, it's not outside the realm of possibility. So um, this, I, I, have, I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but this thing called ADO step functions, which is basically trying to bring the state back into the picture and it's a, uh, I see it as a state machine. Um, it looks like, and they, they focus a lot on the visual. Why is it not? 
And if you can see my screen, and I think I... Yep, I see it. And so we're basically building these workflows. Uh, if you look at a second diagram, you have a lambda over there, but your state is maintained in this depth function. So in that way, you can schedule things, you can have them running in parallel or sequence or on failure. And that way you can, I don't know, is this what you're looking for, Alex? Um, I, 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 is this something that you can do in spy, like on the CLI? Or is this like a workflow builder that you have to click and click around in the AWS console to do? Because um, it looks like this is in the ballpark. Um, yeah, like where one uh, lambda kind of is an orchestrator of other lambdas. Right. So it's not that one lambda is the orchestrator of lambdas. I think this is a separate service. It's called set functions, which orchestrates lambda. The okay. Not necessarily a lambda. I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, but it, but this step function service orchestrates lambdas and all other tasks. Um, they, they do sell the visual part of it, but I believe, at least I think I know in Python, they have a Python API to it. So uh, I was actually thinking of building a uh, long time ago, a Python API to this, a, a textual notation for those visual diagrams. So I, they do have a prog programmatic interface to it. Actually, I'm just thinking now about uh, that, you know, I, that, that, that I have that uh, idea I had about how closely AF corresponds to these, this um, functions thing. And I, I, I don't know, I think, I think the better correspondence in the programming world would be, uh, um, what do you call it, communicating sequential processes like the CSP thing or the actor model. Because each of these lambdas, you think of it as running all the time, but in, re in reality, it does not run all the time. It just runs once and then quits. It goes into hibernation, and it and it just it's it's ready to be called again later. So the, it is like essentially a message passing thing between these functions. Like I don't. Yeah. 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 I mean, I see some lip problems. So I like I don't know. AF doesn't have like you can't c c like say that AF. Um, you you can implement an actor model in terms of AF. Can you? It seems like that doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, no, actors are kind of don't really fit in with how F works, as far as I understand it. They kind of like. Um, well, because actor model is like message passing, right? Yeah. And yeah. F, F, like I suppose you could um, see, uh, implement an F instance for actor model, where each bind function from one um, F thing to the next serializes and passes that as a message to the next. Um, actor in that AF thing. I don't know. Yeah, but it, it, yeah, it's, it seems like AF would be the uh, wrong correspondence. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, um, any other questions? Yeah, thanks for showing that. It's really nice to see uh, what it looks like, like tangibly, <laughs> this yeah. serialist stuff. Yeah, I was surprised. I mean, I, after I made things, after I moved things to point one, two, three, or three, and it just worked. And that was pretty, pretty good to see. So mm -hmm. I, I want to build a small app on, on, on the side with this. And I'm just looking forward to seeing how far I can push it. Uh, and, and then maybe I'll look at the, your script web, the the pure, the pure, your script web web server, uh, just to see how they build it. But mm -hmm. uh, for now, yeah, I'm just trying to see how far I can push this thing. Yeah, right. yeah. The big inter the big advantage of using Express is that you can easily pull in a, a bunch of middlewares from the JavaScript ecosystem. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the only big advantage I see. Right. And there was a pure script extension. <laughs> for Express, uh, for, mm -hmm. Express for Express, which which won't in my favor. So cool. I mean, thanks guys. Thanks for uh, coming around and uh, listening to this talk. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, hosting the discussion. It's really great. My pleasure. So I don't know how this works. 
Like maybe just close this. Uh, are these yeah, you can do your stop sharing. I'll, I'll uh, stop the uh, meeting here then. Thanks all for coming. Oh, I just, actually, oh. this isn't really a question about the talk, but um, I just wondered how you were sort of finding uh, PureScript and things like that, Rajiv. As you mentioned, you haven't been working with it too long, but um, I'm just interested in your perspective for like what it's like kind of trying to do stuff with it as someone who's not like, you know, hasn't been using it for too long. Um, so, I, so I don't mention, I, I actually, that wasn't the reason, but I left my job uh, for something else. I want to work on Julia. And I said, before I work on Julia, I work on PureScript. So I, I was trying to learn PureScript. The thing is to learn PureScript before that, I was trying to do it once a month for an hour or two. And that, that wasn't working out because the tooling, uh, for example, like, I mean, uh, for example, Atom is an amazing plugin for it to work, but then uh, I have to sometimes go to the pulp. For example, let's say I install a new, let's say I'm working in Atom right now, and I install a new library, and then I have to uh, import the new library. So in that case, I can okay, now, when I'm saying it, what I normally do is I go to the REPL, I do a pulp build, make things work there and then come back. But now I'm, I'm talking to you, I, I think I can do a build in the ID as well. I feel like maybe it didn't work for me. So these small, small things. Um, the thing is, I, I, I do find it a bit of a stretch to learn about Monad transformers, for example, and all those things. Uh, but if I stick simply to uh, Monad and in my first uh, lesson, uh, my first blog article, I just wrote about Mo I learned about monads, and I was just using either uh, string for catching my errors, and that worked out to be very well worked out well for me. Um, I would so in in some rambling, it's a, it's learning curve learning curve to learn monads. Where I think what ha what is that happens is you can get away with not understanding a lot of things in pure script and just make things work. Right, for example, the Express app, uh, just the interface was so well designed. Uh, the, the handler monad and the app monad was so well designed. Uh, I didn't really have to go and dig into its specifics. I could make it work. So in that sense, um, I think once, yeah, th th that's the challenge of learning PureScript. You have to understand monads a bit uh, to get a real application working. And uh, I, I think the best, the best help I got was actually from uh, Phil's uh, pure script by example. That really helped me. Uh, so in short, the learning curve, but it's not that big. I, I think it's a, a few hours of, of effort, some, somebody can learn pure script. Is this, is that, I think what scares people a lot is when they see a lot of these types front, like you see a monoid, you would see a monad, then you would see um, uh, a natural transformation, and you see all of this at one time, it can like maybe be intimidating. Uh, I wish there was a, I wish there was a way of uh, having, you know, like like Racket. Racket has these different levels of teaching. They have these different languages. There's a, there's a language one which is simple, which teaches you the concepts, and then when you want to do uh, meta programming, they teach you uh, they make a new language. They build on the second. They build up with more features. It'd be nice to have something like that in JavaScript, but I don't think that's practical. Uh, <laughs> but um, in short, a bit of learning curve, but I think it's not that bad. Uh, in terms of tooling, Atom's great, uh, and Pulp is great. I think the PSD package thing is a bit um, confusing to me so far. I don't know how to work with it, so I'm still using both. Uh, for example, if I make a library, I still don't know how I how do I bring my library into a PSC package? I, I know Justin wrote an excellent document on PSC package, so I have to read through that. But uh, it would be nice if that things were sorted out and made more simpler. I think. Cool. Well, mean? thanks for yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm glad that you're finding it you know pretty easy to sort of just get things working without necessarily understanding everything top to bottom. Um, yeah. There have been a, a sort of attempt, I think, to do what you were describing, like the racket approach of having a sort of teaching language in that one point in the past, Phil had a uh, prelude he called preface, which was kind of like just simplified a lot of the stuff. It kind of took a lot of the constraints out and kind of used more 
less of the kind of type class machinery and just define things more concretely. Right. But um, I don't know what happened with that. I guess it, it perhaps just didn't work out with what he was doing. It was maybe something he was doing with the book. But um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree that certainly it can be very intimidating if you come to something and like you say, see all natural transformation and all this kind of stuff all over the place. Cause I very much remember that from like when I was, you know, starting with these things as well. Um, but yeah, I mean like for the mono transformers as well, you're right. It's, it's not a topic which is necessarily super easy to get a grasp of, especially if you're reading about it in the abstract. But I found when I was, uh, had a case where I discovered I needed to solve something that involved it, it kind of became a lot, like I understood pretty quickly what was going on with it. I just needed something that motivated me to be like, okay, I have a problem. This is, I know that this is the answer, but I don't really know how to use it yet. Kind of working with that for a while, like it definitely helped with uh, me figuring out, you know, how to put it together. Yeah. I still have problems with it though, because the thing with, uh, <laughs> I, I can, I can use all that stuff great, but the, the thing that always trips me up is at the end when you kind of run the transformers in the right order to get the thing to behave the way you want it to because sometimes I'll have like the exception happens inside the state or vice versa. And, you know, like sometimes there's a bit of juggling of things at the end to try and figure out which, which way I want these things to work out. But yeah, I mean, I certainly wouldn't feel uh, bad about <laughs> being confused by that stuff because it's definitely not, not the simplest uh, task uh, thing to grasp for sure. Yeah. I thought, I thought I understood Monad transformers until I, it, until I was responsible myself for making my own stack and running them and then i'm like i can't figure out how to run these in the right order yeah exactly it's like i just ended up giving up it's like well maybe i'll find some other way to do this i mean i had that this week and i mean i've been using them for quite a while now but still made some mistake and i was like what's this thing doing like why is the writer not happening the right way or whatever but i think another thing that's uh, makes them perhaps more approachable is instead of trying to write them a type which has all of the stick things stacked together is just to use the constraints. So you would write a thing with using like monad state, monad writer and so on over an abstract M because apart from anything, it means you don't have to choose the lit, the order of the stack whilst you're writing most of your code. You're just choosing the capabilities that you want for the thing that you're doing. So you know you want to do some state updates and you want to write some stuff that you're going to get at the end. You know, you can just add, you know, monad state and monad writer constraints. Then you don't have to figure out like, how, what type you want to build until you get to the end and then it's a case of you know <laughs> just using run writer and run state and things like that it will kind of give you the right type out of it just from the order that you put those things together oh so the can like if you program against uh, like type class yes. constraints um, then uh it will generate the right stack for you based on however you based on however however you, you implement the running like exactly. you run state yeah. first and then you run this and you run this and then it'll build the right yeah. type for you because basically just through, oh, just that's through brilliant. Inference, i didn't think it about will that. figure out like oh well he ran run state first so that means that you know a state layer has been eliminated from this thing it still leaves the underlying type abstract but once you've run all of your effects you never actually have to explicitly state what the type of the stack is to, to, to kind of make it work out. So that can definitely, um, you know, be a way of approaching it. Yeah, sticking with a constraint type model. So rather than using the transforms explicitly. So yeah. yeah. That might not mean anything to you right now, but <laughs> if you look up like the MTL type classes and things like that, um, it's definitely, you know, that's, yeah, the approach I find. Yeah, I was wondering like, is there some kind of simple, like for example, uh, scaffolding, like this is the basic you need to know to make your, your app compile and your app work. So like for me, Justin's uh, library was great in that sense. Like I, I used this library to do my, my calls and um, all I used was either. And these are the only two things I needed to know to make my app work. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty by any, any way, but it, it compiled and it worked. So I think I was thinking, and I wrote an article on that, but it would be nice, like people just get into writing something useful, uh, would be like, what is the basic you need to know to make things work? Uh, let's not talk about making it beautiful, but just to make it compile and work. And I think that would be a good starting point for the back end and also for the front end. I mean, halogen, I mean, I gave a talk on halogen last two years ago, uh, but it'd be nice to see maybe a, a, what do you call us a, a, a example app for like all the best practices or some something which a beginner can go uh, get yeah, to yeah. 
and it works and then he can read to the code change something in your ear and see how it affects your app right didn't somebody make one of those right. i saw somebody yeah, link. certainly for halogen there is at least one of those now where someone has kind of put together a basic uh, whatever app. but you yeah you make a good point that really there isn't anything like that for people who are kind of doing standalone server apps or anything like that because most people are probably more approaching it from the front end perspective right. um there are apps out there where you can look at oh, this is how someone's done it, but they're not going to be written in a way which is designed to be easy to kind of learn from. Um, because like, yeah, they, they won't necessarily be explaining why they're doing anything and it'll be specific to the needs of, you know, whatever features they have in their app, but we could definitely, yeah, putting together a couple of examples of that is definitely a project that would probably be pretty interesting and would help out, you know, just, you know, how would I, how should I structure an app that does, something basic with a command line, for instance. Like uh, Christoph, who's here now, has done uh, a couple of CLI apps in PureScript, but um, I don't think there is any like, you know, good resource for how you put those things together. He just like figured it out because he knows what he's doing anyway, so yeah. Yeah, I probably, I mean, since I'll, I'll be, I probably would think, I guess I can make one up for uh, calling the data, I mean, a simple CRUD, uh, CRUD apps, uh, create like you have a web server and a database and i think i mean i think i'll probably work on something like, like that just simple just make things compile and uh, make them work not necessarily use uh, mi the minimum concepts required to make a request from the request from your web browser to your application server to your database and come back i think that would be something i would be i, I can think of doing Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Christoph, were you going to say something there? So you unmute, but then remute yourself. So. Yeah, I was just going to just going to say that <clears throat> the CLI apps I've written so far are basically. I mean, the tricky bit is parsing command line options, but there's a pretty nice library for that now, which uses road to list, so you can do my things pretty nicely. Um, and other than that, I've basically just been programming in F for most of my stuff. So yeah, that's um, a good. Point. I mean, I've written a few just basically scripty things in PureScript as well, you know, just uh, instead of using Bash or whatever, because it's something I'm going to run on Windows and Mac OS and Travis and whatever else. Um, and for those things, it's the same. It basically, it's just using AF and like the FS AF library or whatever. So, is it AF? You mean AFF or is it something else I'm missing? Yeah, AFF. Oh. Um, yeah. I, I saw a library called NeoDoc I recently. Uh, I thought that was a library for command line, passing command arguments. I, I was I was interested in checking it out. Neodoc is a re-implementation of a um, of a Python library, which allows you to write um, basically you write the documentation that you the doc string that you preferably write for your. Um, or that you'd like your application to print. And then what it does is it parses that doc string and turns it into a command line parser. Um, but I know I find th that basically makes me use a string to define, yeah, yeah. right? So um, to define my command line parser. And then it, because it doesn't really have the static information on what type, like what, what parser type that string would become right, so. um, because it's not done in compile type essentially. It's like parsing at runtime. So right. um, you get like these unsafe, um, yeah, you extract unsafe values out of the command line. I, I suppose you, you, you can pre compile those conceivably. Yeah, I've, I've got, uh, that's just like, I've, I've just posted a link, which is like a super simple example that I've been doing. Um, for a library I wrote recently, which uses Obligative, which is like the command line parsing library in PureScript that I'd recommend you use. You can see it's super easy to just parse like some some flags and you know that works pretty out, works out pretty well, and the documentation for that library is pretty nice. So if anyone like wants more examples of that, I can certainly give some. Cool. I mean that's good. All right. So I know, like, 
Uh, yeah, so probably, yeah, I, I guess I see more of a focus on the front end and that makes sense for OPGO script, but I, I just like, I like the back end also. So, so I guess I'm going to work on that direction. Right, and I mean, there are a few folks that build a bunch of, back, have, like have built and keep on building back end applications in your script. Um, and you can usually, like, you can definitely find them in, in the Pusecoop Slack if you've ever, if you're like around there. Um, Palu, so P A L U H, is like uh, they're building a bunch of back end Pusecoop stuff. Um, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ares. Thank you for uh, all the tips, and uh, I think I'll bug you in the next few weeks to come. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah, please do. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, nothing is scheduled for next month's uh, PS Unscripted yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll look for something sooner than um, <laughs> I did this month. They kind of got out of hand. Um, yeah, then I was also looking to maybe get a peer script uh, podcast going, like something that's not video, just audio only, get, get, to give that a try and see how that goes. Um, so if anybody wants to help with that or is interested, I made a post on the discourse. Um, yeah, let's see, what else? Um, I think that's about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've been doing I've been doing a lot of research on logic and uh, like the foundations of math, like some axiom stuff and uh, kind of like the, the mathematical uh, mind process. And I found some interesting books on that. Um, yeah, so I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of interesting reading. I hope at some point to maybe give, give a talk here, um, kind of summarizing the interesting points. Um, yeah, it, it seems like uh, peer scripts uh, like the peer script prelude. All those type classes are kind of an effective axiom axiom basis for uh, uh, like peer script programs. <laughs> if if uh, not 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 quite exactly true, but I don't know. I feel like I feel like there's some comparison there. Um, but yeah, I'll figure it out at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, other, otherwise that's that's uh, as far as administrate administrative aspects. That's all I have to note. Um, Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks all for uh, attending. Cool. Thanks for organizing it as usual. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been coming to these for a little while. They've been kind of busy, but um, I'm trying to get back into it. So, yeah. Yeah, me too. Sorry for being late today. I kind of missed it. Oh, no problem. I know, I know a lot of people like to do uh, uh, watch the recording after it's been annotated and whatnot. Um, yeah, um, later all. <laughs>